When the moon hangs high in the midnight sky Like a cat's claw scratching down And the wolves, they do howl For they smell something foul Mr. Whiskers has come to town He trundles out of the dark Looking for a lark You better pray you don't catch his eye For when he is done having his fun You just might wish you could die <laughs> That air, dead fish, the salty sea, seagull crap. It pairs well with rum, if I do say so myself. Ah, nothing like the coast to freshen up the senses. The ocean, the sea, or really any large body of water has always been a source of mystery to humankind. They are home to many myths, legends, and superstitions that have been around since you fleshy mortals first tied a bunch of wood and hide together and set off onto the open water. In many ways, space holds a similar fascination but the water, the sea, the ocean, it's all much more easily accessible, more readily available, and still remains largely unknown. So, if you haven't guessed, kitties, this week's episode is all about the briny deeps and the mysteries that they hold. Which, of course, means we'll be dealing with a lot of seafaring folk. These people place their lives in the hands of the elements, day in and day out. Say what you will about how that affects them and their personalities, but one thing still runs strong among many maritime workers, and that's superstition. Red skies at night, sailors delight. Red skies in morning, sailors take warning. It's an old superstition regarding the weather, for example. Well, our first little boat outing has to deal with another such superstition. One with ties to old Grecian mythology about what happens to a, a sailor, sailor without, without two, two coins. A Sailor Without Two Coins by A.M.D. Many a sailor, no matter how brave and fearless, knows well how unpredictable and deadly the sea can be. Before every setting of the sails, a prayer goes throughout the crew, praying to God for the safety of their voyage. A wise man knows that prayers are not always answered, and many a man has traveled to the briny depths of the sea, never to be seen again. Some men say, though, they have managed to cheat death in those moments with a ritual that may not be worth living for later. The ritual is fairly simple, but not one that one wants to use unless they are in mortal peril and know it, providing that they are not sinking fast enough in the water to choke their words a man must repeat the words, Devil, Devil take my soul across the sticks. God has abandoned me. Three times at the top of his lungs. If he truly puts himself and his soul into it, the ferryman shall come. No matter how much the waves rage and toss, his ship shall not be turned, nor shall he capsize. 
The man shall feel his wrist grabbed and be pulled into the boat. From there, he will not feel the waves rocking him. He will feel no hunger, no thirst, only the breath in his lungs and the wind blown softly across his wet face. It is important that the man does not look up into the ferryman's eyes. This is because calling him out is a trick. You see, the ferryman will not take a soul across the sticks without payment. He will hear him speak, asking for payment. When he asks, he must proclaim that he is without payment and needs to go get it from home. The ferryman will then begin to row to the sailor's home shore. He cannot look at him at all the entire way. If it takes three days and three nights, it will not matter. This is because if the ferryman looks into your eyes, he will know you are lying and return you to the waters to drown. When you finally reach the shore, the sailor must thank him and tell him he will return shortly. The sailor can never return to the sea after this. The ferryman will never come to the shore to collect, only be there by the water, awaiting his payment. If a sailor ever does set foot on a boat again, he and all the men on it shall perish in a violent and destructive manner. Be warned, though, one cannot outrun the ferryman forever. I know a man who is in his last years and fears closing his eyes at night lest he pass from this world and his soul meet the ferryman once more. He feels the grip around his wrist tighter and tighter at night with each dream when he finally falls into sleep and sees a monstrous face looking at him enraged. No one truly cheats the ferryman. He is simply far more patient than most realize. Welcome back, kitties. That was a short one, I know, and not really much of a story as much as it was um, a bit of mythology or about a ritual. Still, while Charon... Charon? Charon. Charon. I like Charon. Still, Charon may be patient, but I am not. Well, not tonight, anyway. So on to the next tale. Now, one of the worst things that can happen to somebody at sea is to be set adrift. Oh, sure. Drowning is rough, but at least it's over after a few minutes of hell. Being adrift, however, with no food and water, or rather, water, water everywhere, but not a drop to drink, is a sort of hell in and of itself with you hoping that someone, somewhere, sees you and is able to rescue you. Even worse is when you are exposed to the elements, the wind, the salty sea air, and that unforgiving ball of fire in the sky known as the sun. Well, we're going to explore what happens to a man who is living out an even greater hell, as he floats adrift on the ocean, his only reprieve from the blazing sun and his damnation is the starry sky and the, and ocean's, the ocean's cool air. The Ocean's Cool Air by Vincent, Vincent. 
Vinikava. I stared up and into the heavens. Stars dotted the evening sky like little white splotches of paint haphazardly splattered across a black canvas by some wannabe artist believing himself to be the second coming of Jackson Pollock. It reminded me of the type of peace one might find in a terrible, surrealist art gallery, one where pretentious hipsters sip two-buck chuck out of plastic cups, all the while hoping their idiotic interpretations of each exhibit will make others think they're more intelligent than they actually are. On a nearly moonless night, the tiny twinkling specks of light were the only things illuminating the darkness brought on by dusk. I had grown to look forward to nightfall. The days had become unbearable due to the constant bombardment of UV rays that I had been forced to endure. The evening's cool air tended to my damaged skin and gave me reprieve from the daily beatings I took from the sun. The night also provided constellations, which had become a welcomed distraction. The stars told stories, stories that helped me forget, forget about the decrepit old lifeboat in the middle of the ocean that I was stranded in. I barely noticed the commercial fishing boat as it approached my dinghy, a testament to how far gone my mind had become from the weeks of isolation out at sea. Even to this day, I don't know how they managed to spot my tiny boat shrouded in the vast darkness of the open ocean. Hey there! Are you okay? The young man was looking down at me from the bow of the ship. His piercing blue eyes almost glowed in contrast to the black sky behind him. Upon further inspection, I could see the whiskers that had begun to sprout from his face, a result of going days without shaving while out on the water. As he scratched his stubbly chin, more of the crew crowded around the front of the boat to take a gander at me. I suppose a half-dead man marooned out at sea was the strangest sight they'd seen in quite a while, an honor I would hold for only the briefest of moments. He's alive! One of the fishermen shouted. Let's get him up here, now! As I watched the crew frantically buzz around the ship's deck like a bunch of worker bees, trying to figure out how to bring me aboard, a laugh escaped my mouth. Not a loud, bellowing one, mind you, just a tiny giggle. It was the irony of the situation that I found comical. Perhaps that last little chuckle was the humor center of my brain finally fading from the weeks of emotional agony I had sustained, going out not with a bang, but with a whimper, just a tiny giggle. It started with a loud crash across the starboard side of their boat. The fishermen struggled to retain their footing when the powerful impact caused their vessel to rock onto its side, nearly capsizing it. Shouts and expletives streamed from the mouths of the startled sailors as I watched them desperately try to make sense of what had just occurred. Another thunderous clang rang along the side of their ship, and this time it tipped. The once silent ocean air was now filled with the sounds of chaos as the trawler smashed across the surface of the sea, flipping completely upside down and sending the men toppling overboard into the cold, murky water. I struggled to lift my head in order to peer over the side of my dinghy at the anarchy taking place around me. 
The fishermen barely had a chance to breach and catch their breaths before it began pulling them back down into the abyss. Their panic quickly intensified as one by one they started to realize their crewmates were disappearing into the deep, dark sea. You've never truly experienced pandemonium until you've heard a dozen grown men screaming for their lives in the middle of the ocean. The young man who had first greeted me from the ship's bow thrashed and kicked through the water, urgently trying to make his way towards my lifeboat. With salvation mere inches away, he flailed his arms wildly, reaching and grasping with reckless abandon, attempting to grab on to the side. I watched the hope in those piercing blue eyes of his turn to hopelessness as a black, sludge-covered tentacle wrapped itself around his ankle and yanked him back down under with one quick jerk. It was the fishing boat's turn now. Still submerged, the sea beast easily crumpled the already twisted hunk of metal before sinking it down to the watery graveyard at the bottom of the briny deep. There it would join countless other vessels that had shared a similar fate. Without warning, the massive creature erupted from the surface of the sea. I wondered briefly if the salty taste of the water that splashed my face when the beast made its appearance stemmed from the ocean itself or the blood of the men who had died in it. I shut my eyes, hoping not to catch a glimpse of its horrible features. The sound of water trickling around the leviathan's body as it waded towards my lifeboat caused me to wince in fear. Though my eyes were clenched tight, I could still feel its awful presence as it closed in on me. I gagged and choked as the rancid smell of its hot breath forced its way into my nostrils and down my throat. With a thud, it dropped a mangled human limb across my lap, one of the fisherman's arms to be precise. It spoke only one word, the same word it had said to me many times before, and the same word it would repeat many times after. <laughs> and with that it slithered back into the sea, leaving me to myself again. I opened my eyes and stared down at the mutilated piece of flesh lying across my sunburnt thighs. For a moment, I was tempted to throw it back overboard, but thought the better of it, fearing retaliation from the creature for not listening to its commands. For whatever reason, it seemed to want me alive, but I wasn't about to test its patience. I sunk my teeth into the skin and tore a chunk of muscle from the bone. It had been a week since I had last eaten. The hunger pains in my stomach helped to subdue the horrors in my mind and made the atrocity of cannibalism slightly easier. I let out a sigh and looked back up to the starry night. I was alone again. Once more, only silence reigned over the ocean's cool air. No! There you are. Welcome back. Talk about your bait and switch, eh? Well, we're on our final tale now, and this one is a special treat. See, it's an allegedly true account by a man who works as part of a dredging crew. 
Don't worry, he explains what that entails. And has been doing it for quite a few years. Which of course means he's had a number of odd encounters during his time. So join us as he tells us about what What lies lies below. What Lies Below by Jungus I worked in the dredging industry for quite some time now. For those of you unaware of what dredging is, it's a sector of marine construction that involves excavating the bottom of a body of water and relocating the material elsewhere. If you've ever been to a beach on the east coast of the U.S., there's a pretty fair chance that we were the ones who put that sand under your feet. Coastal restoration was our most lucrative and commonplace type of contract, but over the years, our tasks have ranged to most everything imaginable. We've had military contracts where we've removed UXOs from the ocean. We've had marsh jobs, cleaning decades of silt and what was buried within it, from waterways. The variety in the work we've done is innumerable, and, I might add, not limited to the USA. So to keep it brief, dredging is simply digging up the bottom of a body of water, and water is very good at hiding its inhabitants. This will be a collection of the unexplainable or extraordinary things I've seen over the years. Please keep in mind that these instances are quite uncommon, and given an opportunity to investigate further, would most likely be revealed as mundane. But under the shadows of night, fog, grove, and depth, these specters make good stories. I feel it appropriate to begin with my personal first unexplainable encounter in the dredging world. I was relatively new to the industry since most of the men who work in dredging are lifers or retired navy, still a virgin to the ocean's wonders and horrors. I was working on a clamshell dredge. Quickly, A clamshell dredge is a barge with a massive crane on it that operates a bucket, shaped like a clam, and dips underwater, clamps the material from the bottom, and swings it over to a holding barge on either side of the dredge. I highly recommend a quick Google search for visualization. Thus, everything that is pulled from the ocean ends up in the holding barge, also known as a scow and can be seen from any elevated vantage point from on board the dredge. Thus, everything that is pulled from the ocean ends up in the holding barge, also known as a scow, and can be seen from any elevated vantage point from on board the dredge. Nearly 100% of the time, the scow is filled with mud, water, logs, and other combinations of detritus tailored specific to the type of job we're on. But on those rare good days, we'll fish up an anchor, a table or chairs, even a cannon one time, or other interesting relics dammed to the deep until our hollowed vessel raised them from their aquatic perdition. This was one of the best days. A deckhand performing a routine scow inspection notified the crew that there was a treasure chest partially buried in the mud of the scow. We were digging off the coast of Louisiana at the time, and skepticism that it was actually a treasure chest was high, and rightfully so. Since no one is actually allowed down into the scow for safety reasons, the operator picked the section of the mud that the chest was in up with the crane, raised it to deck level with the scow, and two crew members retrieved it from there. Given that two men hoisted it out with certain ease, any lingering hopes of it being filled with gold were instantly silenced. 
interest noticeably lowered amongst the crew. A few guys stuck around to offer their passive gaze. Me, just barely graduated from my green hard hat, was all but ogling the chest. After busting the lock off with the sledge, my eyes widened with the chest's maw when we could finally see what was inside. They might have just widened all 180 degrees with it. Inside were ingredients. Ritualistic ingredients. Strange religious icons. What looked like fat pitchforks with spiral insignias on them filled the chest nearly to the brim. Interwoven amongst them were other totems, small animal remains, Bones all but picked clean by shrimp or minnows compact enough to infiltrate the chest's tight breeches. Odd jewelry, seemingly fashioned from rodent skulls and rocks bound together with hair, was snagged between the other inhabitants. Maybe a book had been in there. We found what looked like the remains of a leather-bound spine, the rest of the pages long dispersed amidst the gulf. And, second most creepy of all, was a human skull. It was small, about the size of a three- or four-year-old, maybe. And while the other goodies were partially buried under the pitchforks, the skull was perfectly atop them. But there were no other human-sized limbs in the chest. Even after we pulled out a crowbar, no one dared actually touch the box of Satan's groceries. We did a little sifting. We found no other bones sized even close to that of a child. It was just his or her head. Now, you're probably thinking, what could be in a voodoo-style ritual chest that's creepier than a kid's head? Well, the scratch marks. Scratch marks varying in streaks of three, four, or five, covered the entire inside of the chest's lid. There just weren't any bones that could have made them, or any way they could have gotten out. We re-locked it with a padlock and tossed it overboard. This next one was pretty unbelievable. I actually had trouble going into the ocean after this. The job was off of the coast in the middle of nowhere outback Australia. There was a refinery out there, and we were to pull mud and sand from the Indian Ocean and create a bank against a cliff face to help stop erosion for another hundred years or whatever. The point is, we were using what was called a cutter dredge. Once again, quickly, this dredge grinds up material and suctions it up via a massive drill at the working bow of the barge. If you didn't Google the other dredge, please do yourself a favor and look up this one. It's badass. Then, using hundreds of feet of steel pipeline that we set up, the mud and sand is pumped all the way to the shore. One day, the barge started healing starboard side. Most dredges are set up on spuds, giant pillars that actually work as feet. Thus, the dredge was standing 40 feet below on the bottom of the ocean instead of floating. Dredges tip like this all the time because the spuds can be staggered at different heights to change the angle at which the cutter can operate. So the crew only became unnerved when the operator announced on the radio that he was not shifting the spuds. A 250-foot barge was being pulled over. At this point, the shore crew radioed us from land and asked if we had stopped digging because the material had ceased. Noticeably panicked, I remember the captain laughing through his answer in utter disbelief. Yeah, we stopped. I think something is trying to pull us under. Now, this isn't as dramatic as I'm accidentally making it sound. Sure, it would take something the size of a sperm whale to shift us on our spuds, but the dredge was only dispositional by a few degrees. On board, the angle was barely noticeable. My office chair would sluggishly roll, and only when I took my hands off my desk. What is dramatic 
is what the dive crew found the next day. The four foot in diameter steel piping had been parted and collapsed on one end. Steel piping had been torn through and bent closed. There are things in the ocean that can bend steel piping. The creepiest part, I quivered when I saw the diver's pictures, was that the end of the piping was pulled out away from the shore, down towards a drop-off on the ocean floor. The darkness swirled around the edge of the piping. Shortly past that was the ocean's invisible frontier. From the camera's point of view, we looked like we were tethered straight to hell. This next story takes place back on the Cutter Dredge, so I can skip the sleep-inducing yet largely necessary introduction. Our job was to grind up large rocks and debris on the ocean floor off the east coast of Florida so that a different dredge can raise the material up more efficiently. While cutting dense rock, you can feel the impact from topside of the dredge. After hours of being constantly jostled, your mind will just begin to ignore the repeated stimuli. It's similar to how when you step into a room for the first time, you can smell its distinct odor. But after you've been in there for a few minutes, the room's odor neutralizes. When the dredge suddenly stopped jostling, without the operator having stopped us to move forward, we all noticed the change in our body's equilibrium. We also all noticed the plume of red water dyeing the ocean's surface around us. I didn't see the eruption myself, but the operator of the drill said that the blood just exploded from the deep the bright red a stark contrast from the light-tinted royal blue. Now, for perspective, we've never drilled anything that produced visible blood before. First off, we send out periodic electric shocks in the water to keep all fish of all sizes away from the drilling area. Second, the dredge was surrounded by blood. Picture a rubber duck in a bathtub. Our 250-foot craft was the rubber duck, and the deep red water was the surface size of the tub. At first, we didn't even think it was blood because it was so plentiful, but we had absolutely no other explanation for what it could have been. The four sharks that showed up a few minutes later stopped us from racking our brains any further. Typically, divers aren't used to survey the sea floor, only to inspect equipment. But we had an ecologist on board to watch for sea turtles approaching the drill area. It's required by law for certain jobs, in spite of our own aforementioned precautions. She insisted that we dive to investigate, and I'm kind of glad she did. The divers came out the following day. It's typically a day or two of bureaucracy before we can get unscheduled divers out, so the blood was gone by this time. All that was found was a graveyard of one. Bone fragments were strewn about the sea floor, but no parts of flesh had survived a whole day's onslaught of ravenous sea scavengers. Also, there was no identifiable body. Whatever was struck by our drill could not have survived. The blood was too prolific. But the bones were too badly damaged to point towards any definitive skeleton. The fragments were surfaced and taken by the state for analysis. I never saw a Yahoo article claiming we had killed a sea monster, so I'm not sure what their findings were. These final stories all take place on a crew boat. A crew boat is a smaller vessel, typically 30 to 40 feet, taken out from shore to the larger vessels in the fleet. That is to say, you are more vulnerable on crew boats than dredges. This first ride is from off the coast of Brazil, 
The run took around 45 minutes to reach the dredge, but since I was on night shift, the run took around an hour due to lower visibility. This was a clear night with very calm waves. When the waves are gentle, the crew boat barely sways. It feels like Mother Nature herself is actually rocking you to sleep. These are the best naps I've taken in my entire life. Anyway, about 30 minutes into our ride out, a thick fog just appeared around our boat. It was almost like a magician snapping his fingers and smoke engulfing him for his getaway, but less dramatic and more unnerving. This isn't supernatural, though. Flash fog is pretty common, and it does just phase in and out in seemingly no time at all. Still, no matter how ordinary it is, being suddenly suffocated out of nowhere puts any man on edge. Needless to say, the crew boat had to slow its pace further due to critically low visibility. This is when we noticed something that did seem unnatural. With our speed cut to a slow trawl, the waves began to catch our attention. They were much higher now, maybe a foot to a foot and a half high, and there was no wind. It was still a calm night, just as it had always been, but now the waves were rough. In order to combat seasickness, or even just discomfort when subject to bouncing waves, you're supposed to look out over the water. Do not close your eyes or follow the horizon. You want your eyes to agree with the fluid in your ears that registers the imbalances around you. So as I scanned the water, I saw it through the fog. It was only about 20 yards from the boat, at the very edge of our visibility through the unrevealing air. It looked like a whale's blowhole, but it protruded from the back rather than situated at surface level. It was more like a blow spout. It would expand and contract in slow, rhythmic beats. From this spout, the thickest of the fog would rise. I could see just past it on either side, but just above it was an impregnable opaque. I tried to follow the spout to the water surface with my eyes, but the fog cut me off. With my view censored, I continued squinting at the odd appendage. This was when I realized that it wasn't moving. Or rather, it wasn't moving laterally. As the crew boat continued forward, the spout was becoming less and less visible, but it was rotating in a manner such that I always saw the same side of it, as if it was tracing our boat with a hidden sense that required a rigid line of reference. This whole time, I hadn't said a word to the other men. I was entranced by wonderment and intrigue. These emotions changed when the spout fell behind a thick patch of fog, and my gaze trailed down to the wake outside of our boat. A dark mass could be seen just a few feet from the hull of our ship. A few feet wide, this shadow trailed off under the fog, spanning at least... 30 feet in length. If, something that I began to speculate later, it was the same mass connected to the fog spout, it must have been at least 60 feet long. I remember shuddering and reeling my attention back into what the spout could have been. There are shadows lurking under the surface all the time, and they are never as mysterious or terrifying as the beast your mind fabricates for them. This time may be an exception to that rule. After our boat pulled out of the fog and arrived at the dredge later on, it occurred to me that the shadow was also listing to face us. Whatever it was, it was eyeing us, and was at least twice as large as our vessel. In my entire dredging career, I've only seen one man die on the job. This is a surprisingly gracious record given the mortality rate for this profession. How this man died was not entirely 
unexplainable, but it was ghastly nonetheless. In the northern states, on days of considerable cold, the waves that splash up onto the deck of the crew boat will actually freeze over. The crew will be riding in the cab, but when we step out onto the deck to transfer, there will be visible ice glossed over the outside. One time, a deckhand opened the hatch of the cab and went out onto the deck. He was going to put down some rock salt to help with our transfer as we were slowly nearing the dredge. Then we all heard him yell, What the fuck? And a splash soon followed. He never surfaced. The sub-zero waters and no way to dry off would have killed any man out here in a matter of minutes. State divers arrived within the hour, and they found his body almost immediately. He was just floating at about six feet, frozen solid. The rescue personnel couldn't even lower his arms to secure him to the stretcher, nor could they pry his fingers open to remove the knife. No marks were found on his body, and the report read that he had accidentally slipped overboard. The thing is, the deck has a railing on both sides. All transfers from the crew boat happen at the stern, where there's an opening in this railing. But the bag and salt lines never made it past midship. This next instance, we were dredging down in the Keys. This was on the Gulf side, so sadly I have nothing to testify for the Bermuda Triangle in my repertoire. During another heavenly long cruise in the morning, about an hour and a half in permissible weather, the unknown was in front of us rather than below. Listing into our path was a shrimping vessel. The two outrigger booms were a dead giveaway to its identity. As our craft approached, we noticed that it wasn't trawling. None of its balloon nets were cast, and it wasn't running. It was just drifting. No anchor, no engine. Unless you see someone rod fishing or breaking into a beer on board, a drifting vessel is almost always a negative sign. The crew boat captain radioed the vessel's call signal on channel 13, the Coast Guard required monitor frequency, but there was no answer. Now, this was back in the 90s where safety red tape was less adhesive and more of a guideline. So we did what any self-respecting sailor would do, and boarded the trawler. We moored stern to stern with the derelict craft, and me and two other guys jumped on board. As expected, we almost caught ourselves in the balloon nets that were scattered on deck. After untangling our boots, the deckhand and I went to see if there was any owner identification or, God forbid, bodies in the cabin. It's not too often that a boat is intentionally left unattended. We didn't have too much luck, but we had enough. The walls were stained a reddish yellow from rising algae or such, and the cabin reeked of iron and guano, and was in utter disarray. Most of the furnishings were eviscerated and their contents scattered afoot. Also, since the cabin door was left open, any of the surviving documents were ruined by infiltrating rain or tide. However, given the call sign on the bow, which will remain unnamed, and a few accompanying certificates of inspection framed on the walls barely safe above the invading waters, we managed to ID the ship. Successful and with the captain radioing the Coast Guard with the ship's coordinates, me and the deckhand started back to our crew boat. This is where the third man comes into play. The mate, who took a rather long time joining us inside the cabin, was still on deck, carefully palming through the nets. Looking for shrimp? I remember the deckhand jesting. It was pretty good, so I let out a <laughs> nice... I couldn't tell if the mate was less amused, or even registered what he had said. 
because the next thing he did was hold the net up to our faces. Tangled within the woven nylon beyond any means of escape was a human hand, its fingers curled around the net as if for dear life, the bone still barely held together by its few most robust tendons. The Coast Guard arrived in about two hours, and make of it what you will informed us that the fishing boat had only just left for a registered commercial run 18 hours prior. The ship looked like it had been wayward for weeks, enduring everything offered by inclement weather and carrion feeding cycles. But the facts just stated otherwise. Its dilapidated state was simply unjustifiable. We left the rest up to the Coast Guard and resumed our trek out to the dredge. Along the way, we chatted and japed, happy with only a half day's left of work ahead of us. Except the mate. He wasn't too jolly. I wouldn't call his demeanor frightened or shaken. It was more concerned and quizzical. He let us know, eventually, what was on his mind. The net he was inspecting had a large hole thrashed in it. And apparently... We idiots didn't notice that the cabin door wasn't open. It was gone. The hinges were splayed, the door was ripped off, and your heads were so far up each other's asses that you stumbled into that cabin anyway. Were his exact words, I believe. Perhaps the Coast Guard figured out what had happened on that trawler, but we sure as hell couldn't come up with anything close. And that's it. An entire lifetime at sea, and these are what I have to show for it. No monsters, no demons, only stories. Stories that the ocean told to me. The darkest shadows, the ones cast below the surface of the water, are what spun these yarns. No one truly knows what we've seen, staring from our man-made craft into the primordial abyss. But what I do know for certain is that the ocean is a mysterious place. So mysterious that an entire life spent buys naught but hints and more questions. Perhaps the sea is hiding creatures more fearsome than the abyssal nightmare that can only be created in our own mind's eye. Or it hides nothing. The ocean may just be a talented pretender, tricking anyone too willing to believe. So the choice is yours. Do you see shadows, or do you see monsters? Hmm, so many possibilities. That unknown quantity certainly gives one food for the imagination to run away with. Even if the solution is simple, you know it's not where the creative mind will dwell. No, it will think up beasties and wild phenomenon as an explanation. Too bad the rational mind is such a spoil sport. At least until the creative mind is proven right at some point. Hmm. That is food for thought. Well now, my kitties, I believe that is it for this week's stories. I do hope you enjoy. Alas, my friends, the time has come. I do believe my stories are done. Over that horizon I must sail. We'll meet again in person or beyond the pale. <laughs>
The Mad Catter presents Twisted Tea Time is copyright 2017 by Z.P. Gowdy. All stories are the properties of their respective authors and are obtained via direct permission, creative commons, or their simply public domain. Twisted Tea Time is executively produced for RenegadeRadio.com by Charlie Renegade. You can listen to Twisted Tea Time on RenegadeRadio.com Saturday nights at 9 o'clock p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Music for Twisted Tea Time is used courtesy of Kevin McLeod and Incompetech.com. Jason White at SoundCloud.com slash Angels dash of dash despair. And Mew at SoundCloud.com slash M-Y-U-U. Details can be found in the short notes. If you want to support this show, please go to www.patreon.com slash the mad catter. For more of me and my mischief, find my charming grin on facebook.com slash Cheshire Hats or on Twitter at Real Mad Catter. You can also download past episodes from SoundCloud at soundcloud.com slash Cheshire Hats. Well, and good night, kitties, and sweet dreams.